and I just realized I probably need to kill the. Can you hear that music in the background? I pretty clearly can hear the music in the background. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, welcome everyone. We're live with Matthew Gates, who's going to be talking cannabis microbiome and uh, emerging research and what we know. There's Matthew right there. So let me, why don't you take over and let me go. I got to walk over to kill the music. Yeah, no problem. So for those who don't know, my name is Matthew Gates and I'm an integrated pest management specialist and I've been working in the cannabis industry for about 10 years. It'll be a little bit over 11 this coming year. And I've written some articles recently in Skunk Magazine, for example, on the cannabis microbiome, uh, microbiome research in general, whether it's for humans or insects or um, plants for that matter um, are, is a really interesting topic to me. It's a very relevant topic to integrated pest management, whether you're trying to use beneficial microbes that are uh, pathogens of pests like insects or things like that, or whether those microbes are going to be used um, as sort of a nutrient facilitator or as a, uh, as a com uh, competition for other microbes that are pathogenic or maybe to modulate the uh, populations in the in the bulk soil or even in the rhizosphere and the distinction between those two things. And there's just been a lot of really interesting research about this sort of topic, um, this really multidisciplinary topic. And so um, cannabis is no different from any other sort of uh, plant topic with regards to that, except for the fact that there's a dearth of research. We're just starting to see a lot more of it come out. And I thought this would be a great time since I've been doing a lot of research on the topic for my own professional reasons um, to sort of share a lot of that info out here in the uh, in this video presentation, which I have entitled here, Cannabis Microbiome, Invisible Influencers, Mutualists, Parasites, and Those Between. And I think it'd be really good to just start off and say that um, I'm going to use some technical lingo, but if uh, it's not easily understood or if people have questions, I'm very happy to sort of expand on that topic. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I want to mention is that um, people have probably heard the word symbiosis before, but a lot of times people use that uh, interchangeably with another word like synergy, and they're not really the same thing from an ecological perspective anyways. They're actually technical terms. Symbioses are good things like mutualisms or bad things like parasitisms. And there are also things that are kind of in between, which is sometimes hard to articulate. Maybe something has a beneficial effect and a negative effect in many contexts or only a few contexts. And, you know, um, that can be a little bit hard to describe sometimes. And we're always learning new things about microbes. A lot of microbes are just not culturable either, which makes it really, or at least not easily culturable. So it can also be very difficult to understand that. And sometimes things are obligate Paras parasites or symbionts, meaning that they have to have their host in order to function or their vector. And in that case, it's also really hard to study them isolated from their host plant or their vector insect or mite or something like this. But um, yeah, symbioses are the good things, the bad things, and everything in between. So when I use the word symbiosis, I mean it in that way. And um, yeah. Another thing to talk about is this recent research about something called the hollow genome theory. The hollow genome theory, put really simply, is basically the acknowledgement that we're all kind of meta-organisms. One of the words we sometimes use or phrases is a composite organism. The fact that there are sort of what are called endogenous uh, genes and cells in your body that are kind of like your your body, your skin, your hair, you know, your hair, your your face, all of that, all of your organs. But then you've also got bacteria and fungi and other various microbes, viruses, for example, that get into your system, but they're also part of your microbiome. But you're kind of a meta organism. You're a bunch of things put together, either really intimately closely inside you or on you, but also things that closely associate with you too. And it's the same thing with plants. So hollow genome theory is about that. And the reason why it's relevant is because it sort of puts into context a lot of really interesting research about the microbiome in general. And in this topic, we're talking about cannabis in particular. So when it comes to research about where the origin of cannabis comes from and 
what are some of its natural ecological interactions with microbes, we don't really know a whole lot about it, partly because of obvious reasons like prohibition or the fact that a lot of the native territories have expanded over millions of years and retreated. Um, and a lot of people are cultivating plants that may have lost these um, really sensitive and uh, easily mutable or changeable um, interactions because there's a genetic component to uh, microbial interaction. There's a chemical, there's many chemicals and enzymes and proteins that are also relevant both in the roots as well as in the stems and in the leaves and even in the seeds. So I think that it's really important to consider that um, a lot of the research about the cannabis microbiome concurrently uh, often concerns itself with like cultivars that we already kind of know. A lot of hemp cultivars in particular and some of the research references I'll be using will be considering hemp particularly. And they also make points about how maybe their information, maybe the research results might be uh, in some ways influenced by the fact that, you know, these plants are, they've been cultivated, isolated from their uh, original environments or from other environments um, over time. And so that'll change things where you grow things obviously changes things. If you add microbes, if you don't add any microbes, that'll obviously change things. So when we dive into this research and information, I think the ultimate caveat to make uh, is that there's a lot of things we just don't know in as much detail as we wish we did. So I think I'll start off with that at the very least. Um, do you have anything for me, Peter? Uh, I do not. I just have one. So let me know whenever you want me to show our one visual, which is this one. <laughs> uh, which one? Do you see that? Oh, I'm sorry. I have you. I have you all the way over here. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So that's from my. Um, so I have two videos for those who want to know more about this sort of topic um, on my YouTube channel, Zenthanol. Oh, oh yeah. It's it's uh, on my other side. Zenthanol here. Um, it's important to sort of consider that like, um, so, so in these two videos, the global integrated pest management review 2019 parts one and two, I go over in the first one, uh, cannabis evolution essentially. And so what we know currently, or at least as of 2019 and a little bit of 2020, um, about where cannabis kind of came from. Uh, or we think it came from, how it expanded over uh, its territory, and then how it got from the old world to the new world, and um, a lot of things that are interesting about kind of the evolution of plants in general as well. And a lot, a lot of like really cool and fascinating research on this topic has basically come out in the last like five to ten years. So it was a really great time to make that video, or at least the evolution video. Um, the other video I have, the part two, is about cannabis ecology and pest host relationships. And I run the whole gamut between like viroids, viruses, bacteria, fungi, uh, insects, mites. How do they evolve with other plants? How do the interactions start? What are some really important things to know about the sort of microbe, insect, or I should say arthropod uh, plant sort of interaction? And it's been happening for millions of years, almost half a billion years for, for that matter. Um, so in those videos, I reference a bunch of research and I talk about sort of the implications of these interactions, which are very, very intimate. And like I said, have occurred for a very long period of time. One of the biggest ones being, of course, that a lot of pests like vector pathogens, but other insects and other sorts of interactions um, kind of vector more or less beneficial or maybe even kind of neutral microbes. I also want to point out, actually, since I'm on the topic, that microbial symbioses can be positive, negative, or neutral, depending on context that is sort of devoid from their sort of taxonomy, their evolution, or rather not their evolution, but their uh, relatedness to other microbes that might be even super closely related in the same species or the same species, different isolates in the same species. Uh, they can be completely different, despite being like 99% the same. and you know, that that's just a, a fact about microbes is that it's really hard to, in some cases anyways, categorize what's going on and uh, sort of reliably knowing, at least visually on upon visual inspection or sort of other sorts of things like that, you know, what you're actually looking at. Um, 
Yeah, but like pests are a big vector for pathogens, of course, viruses, and there's many uh, pathogenic bacteria that totally rely on um, insects and mites for their vectoring. And these relationships have gone on for, again, like millions of years. So they must be doing something right. <laughs> um, but that graphic up there, uh, if you want to put that on, it basically, yeah. So, so this is from a research report. Um, let me make sure I have the right reference for you here. Because distribution of taxa of culturable bacterial ABC and fungal DEF endophytes isolated from leaves AD, uh, petioles BE and seeds CF of hemp. Petioles, leaf petioles, like those little mini stems that leaves jut off from. Yeah. This is, um, I, I don't have the reference right in front of me actually. Uh, but I could go to my video and find out. But regardless, um, I think I put it in the, the, the slide before. But this is a, kind of a nice microcosm. I used this um, graphic in my skunk article about the cannabis microbiome to kind of illustrate that, uh, well, two big groups, bacteria and fungi, are often on as epiphytes or in plants as endophytes. And they can be on the leaves, they can be on the stems, they can be on the seeds, and they can be in the roots. They can be in, on and in all of these different tissues. And the percentages that you find of these microbes varies considerably between these different structures. It's not really enough to say, oh, well, this organism, this, this microbe, this bacteria colonizes the plant, so it'll work out. Well, no. <laughs> Where does it colonize? How much? How long does it reside in, in or on the plant? These are questions that people should ask about these microbes because especially if you're buying like products, we're buying things that are, that are meant to like benefit your soil or your plant directly or indirectly. I think it's really important to consider these sorts of questions because the research certainly does. And you can tell just by looking even at one research report that there's a lot of complexity when it comes to like microbial colonization and there's tons of things that influence it, but I'm kind of repeating myself by saying that. I think the biggest thing that people don't consider um, are seeds. We have here on the right side, we can see bacteria associated with seeds and fungi associated with seeds. We've got uh, Pantoea and Staphylococcus being um, two really big proportions of the seed endophyte microbiome for cannabis, or at least the cannabis, or the hemp in specific, like I said. I think these are three hemp cultivars, Anka, CRS1, and Yvonne, um, if I'm remembering correctly. And um, yeah, so like we can, I mean, there's huge proportions, like 21% or 37% of the bacteria found were these two, were these two genera. Uh, we look at the fungi, on the other hand, and it's practically 50-50, uh, Cladosporium and Oreobacidium. And a lot of these plant, or a lot of these uh, microbial genera, and the species inside them are pretty common in other other plants and other microbiomes of other plants. And so we can sometimes use this information to kind of extrapolate: uh, is this bacteria, is there like a precedence for this bacteria or fungi or whatever being useful for the plant, or, or the opposite, not very useful at all, pathogenic, for example. But it's not enough because, like I was saying earlier, there is a big genetic component. And over time, um, we've recorded this in various plants and other sorts of animals. Um, as the plant's sort of population grows away from other microbes or other sorts of things they've had relationships with for a long time, the, the sensitive sort of like three-way handshake between the microbe um, and the plant can dissolve away. And it might take. It might be the case that only really generalistic microbes that form relationships with a ton of other kinds of plants that we already know about might be beneficial for the plant. But the sort of specialized interactions might be very less, very much less um, uh, possible. Uh, and it's possible for those interactions to maybe develop or redevelop over time too. Um, but just as just as well, and especially in various environments that you're growing in, soil subs or you know, substrate or various even kinds of soils for that matter, um, and then the climate 
and yeah, like the general environment, those are all going to matter supremely when it comes to microbiome facilitation um, or the very opposite, getting rid of pathogens for that matter. Um, I have my notes here because <clears throat> I have some really cool sort of examples I wanted to make sure to go over because I think that they're sort of undervalued and underrepresented. Um, one thing that the some of the research references that I've um, worked on or that not worked on but I've looked at and that I've also cited in those two videos I mentioned earlier on my channel um, a lot some of those research reports seem to indicate or are interpreted the results are interpreted by those researchers that the cannabis in particular might have what's called like a, a low plant effect or a low rhizosphere effect which basically means that it that the plant doesn't interact with the microbes very much at all in the soil, even in the rhizosphere where the plant would um, sort of have a lot of influence through the use of exudates, through the through the production of compounds that would attract certain microbes or repel other microbes or kind of let the microbe know, hey, you should interact with me. Um, you know, there's something in it for you, essentially. And I think that that's possibly true. It's certainly a possibility. Lots of plants, um, you, but like even like plants, like the like the very commonly cited like brassicae uh, groups, which are like the mustard family, they are uh, oftentimes for a long time we thought that they didn't really develop any mycorrhizal relationships, for example. But it turns out that's not totally true. It's actually like most things, way more complicated than that. Um, but at the same time, there is an uh, important context to be understood when it comes to these sorts of interactions, even the rare interactions. Um, I think, but also in some of this research, and also I feel the same way, it's probably the nature of the research itself that might be you know, heavily influencing the uh, so-called plant or rhizosphere effect of cannabis. I'm not willing to you know, make a statement about how it's it's definitely the case that cannabis doesn't have a really close rhizosphere interaction. And I think the main reason is what I alluded to earlier, which is that cannabis for so long has sort of been cultivated away from its origin point. And I've been dancing around where that is, and I'll just say it here. Um, the research seems to indicate that, well, first of all, cannabis is definitely an old world plant. It's from the Eurasian continent. And we believe through using molecular clock analyses that cannabis and humulus or hops diverge or speciated from a common ancestor about 19 million years ago. And uh, cannabis, as we know it proper, cannabis sativa, which the taxonomy about cannabis sativa and all of that is also a really interesting um, and sort of controversial perspective that I'm not going to dig too deep in here. Um, but that's prob but they think that um, it the, the cannabis genus itself or this and the species cannabis sativa probably after about a million years, so around 18 million years ago, kind of like speciated, it actually became kind of what we know now to be as cannabis. And there's a lot of implications for that. Um, it means that if we wanted to search for microbes that would be um, really compatible with cannabis, they may very well be in the origination area. Uh, but where? Well, it's possible that this sort of speciation event happened in what's now southern China, kind of near the Tibet Plateau. Um, there's a large lake area um, in this sort of southern part of, um, of China, this geographic area. Um, and for a long time, this climate was, to the best of our knowledge and the best of my knowledge, really cold and really arid for a long period of time and would sometimes get beset by monsoon seasonally. Um, the Tibetan plateau and a lot and the Himalayan mountains are actually caused by the Indian subcontinent, which used to be way in the south, actually, like 70 million years ago. It just it moved up and it just crushed into the into the southern part of again like what is now considered to be china and as the as this sort of continent like this plate just like pushed and pushed and pushed into china um it caused the himalayas that's how the, that's how they happened and then so maybe this is the or origination zone 
And over time, though, cannabis, way before humans even existed, uh, it's thought that it spread all over the Eurasian continent, the East and the West. And over time, glaciation and other sorts of um, climactic um, uh, effects, essentially, or, or, or events, um, caused the population to recede and expand multiple times. And populations would get stuck in what's called refugia, which is when, um, which is basically like sheltered areas where the cannabis population maybe gets almost all totally annihilated by like, again, like glacier um, uh, development or, you know, some other sort of crazy thing that we might not even be aware of already. And then they would expand out of that refugia and then they would recede back into those refugia or other refugia. So there was a lot of this sort of like population expansion, rece recession, expansion, recession, which had some interesting dynamics for cannabis development. Um, it's possibly one of the reasons why cannabis is, um, some people describe as triaceous, not just monaceous or diaceous, but triaceous. In other words, that the species or rather the group um, produces both plants that are really that are really like female or male most of the time almost all the time but also produces like phenotypes essentially that are both and that's kind of a matter of course sort of normally um, and this would make sense because a lot of other plants that have both developed in the same area and also have been exposed to this sort of like constant expansion retreat and having to like inbreed when populations are low and then like expanding out and radiating out um, they often also have this sort of um, development as well as like a survival mechanism, you could say. So that's just kind of an interesting little topic. That's not a microbiome thing specifically, but you can see how like the environment in which cannabis developed would obviously have physiological influences. And part of those influences are, of course, going to affect the physiology of the microbes and their symbiosis itself. Um yeah, so probably all of Eurasia has had cannabis at some point. There are even other um, cannabisi, like cumulus, for example, the hops that have expanded out from Eurasia into the south, uh, like into Southeast Asia, into Sahul, which is Australia, um, but also into um, North America, for that matter. In my video, I explore that fact and that possibility that and some people think it's possible cannabis, if, if hops was able to traverse from Eurasia to North America, then it's possible that cannabis could too. And there's some like partly fossilized um, pollen that is really so similar to, to hops. It's kind of hard to really tell the difference between the two because they're like, they're, they're practically fossils, uh, sub fossils, is the term. Um, and like seeds as well is also sort of a, a contentious argument, but I haven't seen any research that sort of says um, conclusively whether or not that ever happened. Um, and it's possible that it happened and then they all got what's called extirpated. In other words, like a localized extinction happened, just like happened in uh, Eurasia. But yeah, so, so, that, so that's just a little bit of context. Um, cannabis, as we know, it comes from the Eurasian continent and perhaps speciated um, along with humulus in like the Southern China area. And so if you wanted to get microbes as well as perhaps exotic pathogens that are very highly adapted to cannabis, you might go searching in those areas, but a lot has happened in the last 18 million years. So, you know, you might be out of luck because of development, human interaction, climate change and all that sort of a thing. Um, so, so that's that context. Any so, uh, questions? So, yeah, just yeah, quickly. Just, sorry, I hear. Yeah. Let me mute you. Okay, so just quickly, it seemed earlier like you were saying that microbes aren't as useful with cannabis in the rhizosphere, which would be demoralizing for <laughs> a lot of people. Yeah, I was saying that the research, uh, several interactions. Oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, yes. okay. The, there was a, a notification, but maybe it's slower on my end. Um, yeah, so some of the researchers have interpreted the results that way, but I don't think that that's necessarily the case. I was making the argument that it's probably an artifact of the research itself, and other researchers even said that too, 
because you can't you can't consider all variables in all cases. And when you already understand that like cannabis probably came from you know the old world and in a certain environment that's very different than it is now and very and with other various plants it's the same way you cultivate a plant so much and away from its natural territory that it starts to develop other interactions or at the very least loses its interaction with with very specialized microbes at that point but it doesn't mean that cannabis doesn't make uh, microbial interactions at all and clearly the research shows that they do definitely have interactions with various microbes whether they want to or not in some cases but my main point is that if you do come across research that says that cannabis uh maybe has sort of a what's called low rhizosphere effect or low plant effect i've heard it called uh take it with a grain of salt because it's probably the case that uh the more complicated answer is yes and no um, and of course, there are tons of microbes that are very much generalistic, and I like to talk about some of them like Buberia bassiana or Azaria fumos rosia that are used in cultivation to control um, uh, pests like insects and that kind of a thing. And they make interactions with tons of different plants um, as sort of generalists. But those specialist interactions might be either in danger of being lost because the genes used to regulate those interactions are also lost because they're not they're, they're no longer being selected for if that makes sense so if you cultivate the plant enough times along uh, you know in different areas they'll develop new symbioses or and lose potentially other symbioses so yeah do, do you see this one uh parasponia yeah. So Fido Alchemist, I, I know him, shout out to him. He does a lot of great research. Um, so yeah, I am. And one of the notes I have here actually, and I'll prove it to you because I have it right here, Perisponia. Perisponia andersonii, um, really neat can uh, member of the cannabaceae, so it's not cannabis. However, and in my video, I talk about this too, which I think Fido Alchemist might be aware of, but um, maybe not in the moment, but I do go over the Perisponia paradox because and here's the really cool thing. Perisponia andersonii is the only non-legume plant that has what are called orthologous genes with legumes. What does that mean? That means that if you take all the legumes, the, brand, the like taxonomic clade, the groove, if you take the legumes, there's a basal ancestor of all legumes that has these genes that um, allow the legumes to have interactions with specifically what are called rhizobia, nitrogen fixing bacteria called rhizobia. And that's significant because Perisponia has the same genes. That means they're, they're orthologous. They are the same. They are truthfully the same ortho meaning correct. So they are the same genes. This implies that Perisponia did not develop a new symbiosis with Rhizobia. It is a very old symbiosis that might be more than 100 million years old. But here's the, here's the problem. Why is it that every other plant that's a basal ancestor that, so like basically the Cannabaceae family and the legumes, so those are part of the uh, Eurozids, I believe. So the Eurozid clade of plants and taxonomic plant, plant taxonomy at that point, there's still a lot of contention there too. So I don't want to get too dirty in the details. But basically the implication is that there's a basal ancestor of both legumes and Cannabaceae and specifically Perisponia that had the same genes, but then for some reason was lost in all the other uh, um, progeny essentially all the other descendants, but it stayed with Perisponia. And there's no real explanation as to why this is. It could possibly be because Perisponia developed in a really interesting place, uh, right past what's called the Wallacea line. And the Wallacea line is a sort of section where organisms that move kind of from, southeast, from the Southeast Asian area to like Sahul and Australia and that sort of part of the world um, basically things that move from the mainland to there, they tend to develop really odd adaptations. Um, it seems like at least for a lot of organisms, they get there and then they can't like make the bridge back 
either because they were like swept up on the wind or swimming or they were caught in water or a monsoon or something. And it's just a very unique um, sort of ecology over there. And it's very notable for that reason. So it's possible Perisponia has some sort of interesting conservation or something, or at least the ancestors and descendants of it too, because Perisponia is also not 100 million years old. It's, you know, as a genus, it's much more recent than that. So that's a really neat concept I thought that people could talk about. And um, uh, let's see. Yeah, so some of the genes that allows it to interact with rhizobia include what's called um, nodule inception. Yeah, so nodule inception, rhizobium-directed polar growth. These are all the names of the genes. And uh, nod factor perception. So these are three genes that were orthologous in both alfalfa, which is a legume, Medicago truncutula and uh, Perisponia andersonii. And nobody knows exactly why. But I bring it up because obviously as a member of the Cannabaceae family, that might be really relevant to cannabis or humulus or ketacma or trima or many other Cannabaceae. Apinanthe is the basal species, is the basal genus of the Cannabaceae family. All the Cannabaceae developed from the Apinanthe um, genus, which was, which we think developed around 70 million years ago, right around the um, sort of dinosaur extinction event with that famous meteor that came crashing down to Earth. Yeah, it survived that. It we think it speciated maybe around that area, around that time, and was like all over uh, Eurasia. Yeah, so that's a really that's really great. Thanks, Albert, for that um, for that quote from Wiki. So rhizobia are diazotrophic bacteria that fix nitrogen after becoming established inside the root nodules of legumes. So I mentioned that gene nod factor, right? Nod, yeah, nod factor perception. It's exactly what it says. It's required for the rhizobia to nodulate to create not you know <laughs> to to create those homes in which they exist. In the, in the roots. If they didn't have that, they, it wouldn't be possible for them to develop those interactions. So just a, a really cool, cool concept there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So does that explain that? I think that was a really great reference to make. Thanks, Fido Alchemist. I do think you explained it, yes. Uh, just looking through the... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there could be potentially no implication either. Um, but I just think it's really cool. The other thing is that Perisponia is a genus that actually is encompassed by another cannabis genus, which doesn't make sense to most people. And even to myself, it's a little bit of an odd interaction. But Trema is the genus, is the parent genus. And apparently Perisponia is, a, is, is still a genus separately, but also inside. Again, plant taxonomy is kind of weird. So how to get this bacteria from nodules into your soil? I guess you have to grow it, Albert Trembley asks. Um, well, you have to have hosts. So I'm pretty sure these diaz... So um, actually, I do have this for you here. Um, the, the, the rhizobia mutualism. So there, there are a couple of groups. This, the, so Frankia... Frankia is the genus of rhizobia that I'm talking about with Perisponia. So they identified that it was Frankia specifically, that genus. Um, but there's Brady rhizobium, which is another genus. Rhizobium, which is another genus. Of course, rhizobia is a kind of bacteria, but rhizobium is the name of the genus that sometimes trips people up. Encifer, and also Meserrhizobium. So those are all... Uh, microbes that were interacting with Perisponia, but the Frankia was the one that was the diazotroph, specifically the rhizobia. Um, so how do you get those into your soil? Well, you got to have plants that interact with that. It's sort of a chicken and the egg question. You have to have the host that will facilitate the, the microbe, uh, unless the microbe is not obligate. So there's two important concepts to have here for microbes in general. One is obligate and the other one is faculative. So something that's faculative 
is something that can eh, take it or leave it. It can interact with the plant in this context, or it can just not. And it can live freely as a free microbe, as they say. Others are obligates. One really popular one you're all already aware of is powdery mildew. Powdery mildew are um, powdery mildews are obligate uh, parasites. It means that they have to have their host in order to exist. They can't just like colonize a wall and live. They have to have a very close relationship with their plant. And there's two other sort of sibling or uh, sort of a uh, child concepts to consider with this too. Um, and that's that. That's the idea of a biotroph and a necrotroph, and also what's called a hemibiotroph or half biotroph. And all that means is, um, if you're a biotroph, that means you play nice with the physiology and you communicate with the plant and basically negotiate to get the resources from the plant in a way that's not just killing the tissues. Necrotrophy is exactly what I just described. It's when you don't <laughs> you don't really care and you're just destroying and lysing cells and just sucking up all those nutrients. Uh, powdery mildews don't do that latter one, but Tritus does. But Tritus actually can do both. And that's what a hemibiotroph is. It's an organism that can do the one and also switch lifestyles to do the other. Why is this relevant? Because many people think that microbes are typically just one or the other, or there's just good or just bad, or that a certain species is one or the other. It's not true. The more we look at microbes, the more that we find that like there's tons of isolates and species and genera that are that have both parasites and mutualists in the same in the same group, or or they're the same organism under different contexts. So it's really hard to make really um, precise but broad uh, statements about the microbiome in general, but for cannabis in particular. I'm uh, so so in terms of generalist versus, I guess, specialist would be the 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 alternative, right? Like what what have we learned about specialists that because uh, with Alice and Jack, who came on the other day, who's talk who's researching Mtros, what I found interesting is that in the Mtro family, you know, there are ones that only really interact with the roots of you know, like that she, that's why she was saying, like, you couldn't just take the corn m and dump them. Like, they don't have a product ready for cannabis yet, but they have a soy product. They have a corn product. Um, mm. So so what do we know about kind of, are there any specialists that uh, are unique to kind of cannabis or, or a sub, you know, from broad to more subcategory? Sure, yeah. I mean, and that's like, you know, uh, that's the thing that I think most people are interested in, including myself. And the intellectually honest answer is um, it's probably, again, more complex. But um, there are some examples that I actually took the time to note here. Um, I just want to make sure I got it. OK, yeah. So there's this research report. I want to make sure I give you guys the on air name that's correct. Um, Was it this one? Evaluating the microbiome of hemp, right? I, uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, it was this one. So this research report came out in the uh, Phytobiomes Journal, which is open access. It's by the American Phytopathology Society. If you have trouble accessing it, I'm happy to send it to anyone who wants it. I mean that. I want people to know this information and be aware of it and be able to take a look at it because sometimes it's available but expensive or not available at all. The report was called Evaluating the Microbiome of Hemp, really simple title. And um, they took a look at uh, various fungi and bacteria that interact with cannabis in particular. And they were, I think they were only looking at cannabis sativa, yeah, Anka. So only the Anka cultivar, whereas in that graphic I showed before, they were looking at CRS1, Evone, and Anka cultivars, all of which are hemp cultivars, important to note. And a lot of, and I think all of them have been around for quite a long time, um, which would sort of play into the argument that maybe if they're sort of a, a streamlined or mainlined cultivar group for, for hemp, 
that perhaps uh, through all of that breeding and cultivation by humans, they might have lost some of their interactions with like that a, that a wild type cannabis group or population might have, if that makes sense. Um, but why I bring it up here is that there were a couple of microbes, and this is actually one of those research reports that tried to look at the rhizosphere soil versus the bulk soil. And what they do is they try to find out whether or not there's a major difference in what they detect between the microbes that are in the, the root zone that is affected by the rhizosphere. So like one to three millimeters, I think, or so of the um, space but, uh, from the roots. And that's where a lot of these microbes that are going to interact with cannabis are going to like uh, basically hang out or they'll be inside the tissue for that matter. Uh, and they kind of didn't find a whole lot of examples where microbes would be very different in the rhizosphere versus the bulk soil. This, and I, when I say bulk soil, I don't mean like like bulk garden department soil. I mean like soil that is not in the rhizosphere. That's the term for it. Um, and here I had that they found um, epic. So one of the one of the few fungi that they called like a core um a taxonomic group that they found was um called epicoxum which i can spell for anyone who wants to know that that's e-p-i-c-o-c-c-u-m so that's a genus epicoxum and they were found in the rhizosphere and the phylosphere so they were found in the roots and also in the leaves and foliage and that sort of a thing and it's associated with disease resistance in grapes which is kind of a neat little thing so that could be a mutualistic um uh, fungus. Uh, there was also one called Bulera alba, that's B-U-L-L-E-R-A, alba, A-L-B-A, which I think means white, um, was found in the flower, leaf, and soil tissues and was considered to have high affinity for hemp. So that was, that was an example where they found a fungus that was very much associated with uh, the cultivars they were testing and under the environments and conditions they were growing. Um, Alternaria infectoria, which three guesses to figure out what it likes to do, um, is a common wheat pathogen that was also found in the flower tissue. Um, but I don't think, but, and I looked for this, I don't think that it was actually um, parasitizing the plant. It just happened to be found um, uh, in the flower tissue and not causing any like damage symptoms or anything like that, which is kind of an odd thing. But then again, here we are, here's just the example I was talking about earlier. Sometimes things are pathogens for some plants and not others, and it's not altogether clear why that would be. Um, and since we're on the topic, other bacterial groups associated with cannabis microbiome include, and you can find a lot of these on my YouTube channel uh, in the Global Integrated Pest Management Review 2019 part two video, where I talk a lot about these microbes. Um, most of the things they found in this research though, was uh, proteobacteria, acetobacteria, and then other various genera. So those, at least for the bacteria, those two large taxonomic groups are really common in plants in general. We had enterobacteriales, pseudomonadales, xanthomonadales, rhizobiales, sphingomonadales, and I can, and again, these are all listed, so for people who want to search more about these, um, there's burkholderiales, so burkholderia, which a lot of people are familiar with as a, um, as one of the many microbes used in cultivation um, for like a pest abatement, actinomycetales, and flavobacteriales, that's, those are all proteobacteria. In the acetobacteria, we found bacteroides, bacteroides uh, plantomycetes, and veruco, verucomicrobia. So those are three other groups. And again, it's hard to really talk about them very generally and broadly, but if you're interested, you can definitely take a look. And the last uh, group, the genera that are kind of various are Pseudomonas, Bacillus, Burkholderia, which I already mentioned, um, Stenotrophomonas, Mycococcus, Pantoea, and Microbacterium. Um, so those are those are microbes that were found in uh, cannabis in various research reports that I kind of conglomerated here and aggregated for us to talk about. Um, most of those I recognize from various other plants. Um, many they encompass parasites and mutualists and um, again everything in between.
So the next research will have to be looking at characterizing these relationships, which specific species were found and what isolates and are there anything, um, is there anything interesting about those differences in those um, populations? Why, hello there. I'm, I, I'm working on the light giveaway for everyone who's complaining that, uh, that we need more cleavage and giveaways. I, Matt, Matthew, oh, okay. I, I, I offered up your cleavage, but, uh, well, there, there, there were no just, stickers. <laughs> That's why I wore this shirt so that like, you could see right. this, uh, I keep going over yeah. here. I, I don't know why it doesn't change. It didn't move around or anything. But, so uh, ju yeah. ju just going through some of the questions that had uh, come down. CD Soulshine growing. Nice to see you here. Thank you for visiting. How would one go about identifying and capturing the land raised cannabis positive symbiote microbes you would mentioned earlier? Um, so there's a few different ways you would do that. One way you could do that is you could. Uh, uh, I'm going to make some people a little bit angry, but from a biosecurity standpoint, you could irresponsibly just go out and take a bunch of tissue and seeds from wild populations and just plop them into your soil. Nothing bad could happen from that at all. Um, obviously, you know, that's dripping with sarcasm. There's tons of problems. You could get the tissues and there could be pathogens that nobody has you know, discovered or, or uh, categorized yet, or maybe they are microbes that we're familiar with, but they act differently because of where they're from. But to collect them, um, another way you could just simply like take soil samples, like tons of soil samples, and um, and 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 figure out what's in it through uh, through uh, sequencing the genomes. Essentially, is the way that you would probably do it most cost effectively. Not something that uh, you or I or anyone could do very easily or economically, but it's definitely a, a thing that a, a company could do, or some sort of industrial applications could uh, could fund. Um, and then the other thing that you could do is you could take those groups, assuming you found such groups uh, that, that interact with the wild populations. And then you would want to test to see if, cannab if cultivated cannabis populations um, have the genetic like uh, predisposition to interacting with those microbes from the wild types. And that would be the really interesting key to find out. And it could be that they might, they might have the same exact interaction still or it could be that uh, it's cultivar specific. And if you're growing land raised populations, ostensibly, you would probably have a better possible chance to have those interact with their sort of land raised microbes, if that makes sense. And then we had, uh, so actually what one, so the role of mycelium in the soil, um, Brandon had said the other day he feels like trichoderma outcompetes mycorrhiza and therefore he's kind of off the mycorrhiza bandwagon. And then I reached out to Dr. Mike Amaranthus to ask him, and he said for hundreds of millions of years, uh, trichoderma and mycorrhiza have been happily coexisting together, but obviously in a lab, the results may be different where the trichoderma kind of outcompetes. Um, but anyway, that's my rambling, but there was a question there, the role of mycelium in the soil for the microbiome. I think that's a valid interpretation. I mean, even without the context of, of seeing, of seeing that conversation or anything like that, I mean, I would be surprised if all trichoderma species and all mycorrhizal species of which there are many and people are recategorizing, which I have some info about too here in my notes. Um, I would be surprised if they all played, you know, nicely with each other. I'm sure there's been a little bit of variation in the myriad different, you know, eco zones and environments across time and space. Um, but I also, again, wouldn't be surprised if there's trichoderma mycorrhizal, you know, synergy essentially, or even mutualism, but possibly, but also parasitism. There's, there are trichoderma species that are, um, uh, that affect fungi. So I don't know about that statement necessarily, um, but the role of mycelia. So like roles are things that humans categorize organisms into to make it easier for us to understand, but they don't have to be beholden to any of those systems. 
on their face anyways. It's up to us to categorize correctly. And I, and I just say it like this because, um, I guess because I'm pedantic, but also because I think it's important to, to note that. So the mycelium from like a mycorrhizal organism could have defensive effects for the cultivator. Um, it could create what's called a Hartig net potentially, um, or some other sort of like bar physical barrier where the mycelium uh, protects the roots from things like um, sequestering heavy metals or from pathogens that would affect the roots, for example. But, you know, it could also potentially stop uh, other um, endophytes and epiphytes from colonizing inside or on the surface of the roots. So that's just, a, you know, that's, and that's just a matter of the fact that like, if the, if the, if the mycorrhizal fungus produces like a hearting net or something like that, then of course it's going to be a physical barrier to other things that can't break through that, that barrier. That being said, it's possible the hearting net would be um, sort of not comprehensive. And so some things could get in beforehand or in other new roots or things like that. It just really depends on the mycorrhiza and the organism. Um, Another group that I didn't really talk about before are things called um, endohyphal bacteria. So these are bacteria that live in fungi that live in other things or freely. And um, endohyphal bacteria are really, really interesting because they do really fundamental things for other fungi. They're really important for processing toxins or allowing them to produce toxins that allow them to colonize plants, either as pathogens or as mutualists. They often regulate key aspects of their physiology, like reproduction. Um, some of the endohyphal bacteria that have been found in hemp, um, and in fungi, sorry, I should say in fungi, in hemp, include in the Pazizomycetes, so that's a fungus group, um, we found some Novosphingobium, and also an unknown alpha proteobacterium, which is just really kind of odd because proteobacteria um, uh, a lot of them are pathogens, actually, um, but not all. Uh, there's also in the Sordariomycetes, sor sor we found Acinobacter uh, inside the fungus. Uh, in Oreobacidium fungi, we found mycoplasms, and we can also we also found uh, ac Acinetobacter and Staphylococcus. But that's a that's a group of bacteria a lot of people are already familiar with. Um, and many of them are free living. And it's kind of unclear if some of these bacteria, so some of these bacteria are passed from fungus to fungus vertically from parent to offspring. Other ones have to be incorporated uh, horizontally after the fact. And they take them up in the same way that a plant would take them up. Not the exact same way, but conceptually in a similar manner. Um, so yeah, so that's, so, 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 um, yeah, so endohyphal bacteria, they synthesize phytotoxins so they can allow the fungus to actually colonize the plant. Um, they can enhance stress tolerance of the fungal host. Um, they can activate genes involved in the primary and secondary metabolism of the fungus and probably also the plant, the, the other plant host that the fungus is inside. Um, yeah, so these are all really important <laughs> ecological traits and most people don't even talk about endohyphal bacteria. So I just thought that was a really interesting note to make. Oh, and there's also mycorrhizal induced susceptibility. That's when mycorrhizal interactions actually make viruses way more virulent and accumulate more in the plant host. This is a documented phenomenon. And it's an, also another one that I think doesn't get a lot of recognition because most people think that mycorrhizae are you know, totally beneficial, but this is not totally true in all cases. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's yeah, called can, again, micro. Can, can, can you go into this? Cause I'm, my ears perked yes. up when you started saying that. Yeah, absolutely. So the notes I have here word for word is, um, so it's what, and so this is specific, this is specifically about our muscular mycorrhiza, um, where this has been most sort of like researched and, I did a little bit of digging on Google before coming on to here last night. And I, and there are other papers that I haven't looked at yet. So there might be even more cool information about this, but with our muscular mycorrhizae in specific, the uh, colonization facilitates plant virus colonization due to in some research anyways, 
um, improve nutritional status of the plant. So, hey, guess what? Making the plant, giving the plant the nutrients it needs is actually makes it a better food source. Just like how giving the plants we're going to eat the nutrients they need make them a better food source for us. Some people think that if a plant gets all the nutrients it needs, it will no longer be susceptible to pathogens or other problems. But what we call even a pathogen changes over time and context. So I just feel like that's a, one of those broad uh, generalizations that isn't very helpful for a cultivator. And this is an example why. Another reason why it happens is that they delay the induction of uh, pathogenesis related proteins in mycorrhizal plants. So what that means is that um, uh, the fungus makes it so that the plant's immune system doesn't uh, interact negatively for the virus quickly. And this is why I say that there's mutualisms, parasitisms, and things in, in the sort of middle because a mycorrhizal fungus could have a bunch of beneficial nutritive effects, but then it could also modulate the immune system simply for existing on or inside the plant. Uh, because the plant has a, the plant can have like a really basic response to simply detecting the chitin in the fungus cell, even if the fungus is mostly being beneficial for the plant. There's no like conscious recognition, right? Does, does that make sense? It's not like it's like, oh, I know that you're an arbuscular mycorrhiza and I will let you in and give me, you know, the inorganic phosphorus and I'll give you the hexo sugars that you want. It's like a, it's, there's a lot of communication going from a chemical and genetic perspective, but it's not like kind of like how we think about it, if that makes sense. And if you want to read more, the article that I drew those uh, examples from is called um, Arbuscular Mycorrhizal Symbiosis plant, friend, or foe in the fight against viruses, question mark. Frontiers in Microbiology, Plant Pathogen Interactions 2019. So it's pretty recent research. I'm uh, sorry, there is a, uh... give me one second. There was the next one up. Are you, you're, you're kind of tuning into the chat a little bit, right? Or not a a little bit, a little bit. I've been pretty concentrated on giving a cogent response. Uh, yes, that but is. Uh, right. you you stay focused. Let me squint my eyes and scroll through the. Oh, sorry. So uh, persistence does pay off. Um, oh my god! All right, we gotta we're gonna interrupt the regular just quick. Nat Pennington, he has a three o'clock appointment. You all wanted a giveaway. We're gonna do a seed giveaway. So Nat. What what's what's up, and and, and this is uh, let's say U.S. only, because I don't feel like shipping. Uh... Can you hear us? Up oh, there you are. Can you can you hear me, Nat? I think you're a little. Uh... I think we're just. What? I can hear some of what you're saying. Can you hear me now? Our bandwidth in here. So it's 159 and that has a, or no, sorry, did you say your thing's at three o'clock or two o'clock? I know, three minutes. Yeah, I have a call at, at three o'clock today with Danny oh. Danko for like a grow your own podcast thing. Right, right, right. But, so, uh, hi, everybody. If you can see me. You, uh, we're uh, at our office here in Utica, just doing seed work. Say hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a mess, but um, so, I guess Peter's going to do some blueberry muffins. Sure. So, so Matthew, give give us a uh, a bug related trivia question. What are the five other? What are the five main mouth parts of insects? 
<laughs> is that okay. too much? Sorry. Well, so, much? So, so well, that's fine. So you guys, you you got to peck in uh, five. <laughs> yeah, you got to really work for this one. Yeah, but it's uh, a pack of blueberry muffins from Humboldt Seed Company. Uh, and here comes Nat again. So Nat, the uh, trivia question is, oh wait, here we go. Labrum, mandibles, maxillae, hyph- I should, I should have said, uh, I knew this would happen. What are the five main types of mouth, mouth parts, not the five main components of mouth parts? Ah, uh, okay. Sorry right. about that. Now everyone's Googling. The, well, now they'll know about the labrum, the mandible, the maxillae, the labrum, the hypopharynx, which is great to know. The lip scum's teeth. Which, which <laughs> if that were the question, you guys would have won the blueberry muffin. But uh, That's right. But that's not the question. It's not the question. You'll have to look a little bit more for that one because there's the, the fifth one people always forget. Whichever one that is, you'll have to figure it out. And and then we'll let Nat get to hit. Well, Nat, why why don't we? Do, do you got to go right now? Um, Danny Danko's I think supposed to call me. And I don't uh, know. okay, all right. So yeah, just whenever he calls, you can jump off, and we'll we'll figure it out. Uh, uh, but this is for a pack of feminized blueberry muffin or regular or whichever you want, buddy. We got it okay. all. All right. All right, so City said, uh, I don't know if he's the first one, but piercing, sucking, spongy, and siphoning, and chewing. So piercing and sucking is one one kind itself. Two, um, three, four. So he's missing one. He is missing one. It's the one everyone forgets. <laughs> I like this one. Ah, uh, I think Grayson has it. Where's chewing, Patrick? piercing, sponging, siphoning, and lapping. Lapping like a lapping cat, like butterflies. Yes, Butter butterflies lap. I didn't know that. They so get they laugh. Okay, so give me an example of one insect that does each one. So who's who's a chewer? Sure. So like the the ancestral insect mandible is the the gnasher, the chewer, and that's like grasshoppers, uh, for example. They have like a they crush and then imbibe the food that they eat. Uh, sponging, that would be like flies, for example. I think pretty much only, um, you know, with the with their like sponge mouth part that they're always putting on food and stuff. Uh, lapping would be butterflies and moths. Uh, How so, about piercing? So piercing, that's like your hemiptera, your aphids, um, your leaf hoppers, those things that feed on the phloem. And siphoning, did you hit that one? Um. So yeah, so there's chewing. So yeah, chewing, which is like the grasshoppers, piercing, which is like the the hemiptera, um, sponging is like flies, um, siphoning. Am I forgetting? What what's a good siphon example? Um, there are also moths that I guess siphon as well, um, but yeah, All siphoning right, well, and then lapping. So those two both do that because there's a derived mouth part. It's a very, very derived mouth part. So they have some of them that kind of siphon things up and some of them just kind of very, uh, very faintly kind of like lap things. It's, it's like, kind of like the sponging in that way. Okay, well, Grayson, I just sent you my email address and we'll get you a pack. Of, you can pick if you want feminized or regular. If you want all ladies or uh, a mixed bag. So Nat, we appreciate it. I'll check back in with you. Go ahead. Uh, How's the weather? Oh, sorry. Down here in LA, it's uh, 80 and sunny. Uh, yes, that is Nat from Humboldt Seed Company. In it's a Eure beautiful day. In yeah, that's your, you're in Eureka, you said right now? Yeah. This, we're nice. at our in Eureka and I'm I'm about to join I have to get on another podcast which my daughter's trying to figure out right now <laughs> she, she's running tech support yes she she's excellent <laughs> we got All the right. Jelly Rancher um, we're excited about we'll auction that one off another day Peter alright
but it it's looking fire. Very nice. <laughs> anyway, I got to jump off, but that was fun. All right. Thanks, Nat. Bye-bye. All right. Carry on. People wanted product giveaway in addition to Matthew's cleavage, and we did giveaways, so we've checked both we boxes. Both. <laughs> we yeah. checked. All boxes <laughs> have been checked for maximum happiness. You're, you're giving people what they want. What can you, I mean, what else is there, right? Exactly. Well, I, I, I texted, well, I'm gonna keep that one to myself. We, we may have some more surprises, but uh, anyway. So, all right, so we have, we have uh, we've learned something about insect mouth parts. Um, and let, uh, let, yeah, so bees, I can't believe I forgot, but bees are the lappers, ah. and uh, butterflies are the siphoners. Yeah, I get those confused because they're kind of similar structures, or they kind of do similar things, but they're different enough to be called their own thing. And uh, at least I remember that chewing was the basal one. And then all the other ones evolved from chewing mouth parts. So, yeah. Also, fun fact, praying mantises are, uh, they share their ancestry with roaches. And all termites are developed, are, uh, originate from the roach group. I, um, I assume so praying mantises are chewers or what are they? They are chewers. Okay. They are chewers. But um, I feel like it's a great metaphor because like praying mantises are like really great really powerful like for their weight class um <laughs> for their lifestyle ambush predators they're really good at, at that and i guess it's like if you're a cockroach and you live a long time as like a scrounger scavenger um over time you too can be a valiant and noble uh carnivore you know it just takes 100 million years or so most people don't have that time but <laughs> So just going back to some questions, can you add micronized sulfur to soil, same one you use for PM for a nutrient in very low dose? Yeah, I think he means for, uh, for they mean for powdery mildew. Um, you can add my, so I wouldn't, uh, I guess, I guess it depends on how low the, you could always do it, but I wouldn't do it. And I don't know how low a dose would be good without burning the roots or something like that. You should also know that sul sulfur in general, um, it's one of the oldest pesticides used by humans and it's fungicidal, miticidal, insecticidal, um, and it can have other antimicrobial effects, but it depends on the microbe. Um, but like at the same time, it's very broad spectrum in that way. So if you do put it in your soil, you might be running the risk of hurting a lot of things that you don't necessarily want to hurt, including your roots. I'm scrolling way back up to see some of the, if people are going to throw questions in again, so I don't have to scroll so far, but, uh, what, what, Final what alchemy. other things do you have in your, in your notes? I do have a bunch of other things, but final alchemist is saying that no, actually bees lap with their proboscis. So I don't know if that was <laughs> against what I was saying or not, but, uh, yeah, uh, those are the five groups I am embarrassing myself, but not by not remembering, uh, which examples go with which groups, but I'm glad there are people in the chat to correct me because being wrong on the internet is criminal. <laughs> uh, let's see, let's see. What do I have here? I know that I had a really good note about, um, what was it? Oh yeah, so viruses, right? The cannabis virome, all the viruses associated with cannabis is kind of, uh, well, it's super understudied. Um, we probably will find more viruses uh, either that have adapted to cannabis somehow sort of spontane spontaneously or that are already, you know, cannabis affiliated, we just didn't know, or at least are able to interact with cannabis. But um, from a biosecurity perspective, I think it's really critical that people who cultivate cannabis are aware of some of these viruses that infect 
cannabis. Now, before I go any further, I just want to say that no, I don't know if a uh, tobacco mosaic virus uh, infects cannabis. Not for sure anyway, and I haven't read any empirical except for the Hardowitz study, which I know a lot of people like to cite in that um, in that uh, Cannabis Pests and Diseases uh, book by, I think, Clark or uh, uh, I mean, I'm blanking on the name, but the Hardwood study that he references uh, or that they reference um, with regards to viruses of cannabis is kind of during a time like in the 1960s, I want to say, or maybe earlier where we didn't really have the genetic, uh, the ability to sequence genomes and things like we do now. And so I think that's kind of sort of outdated, obviated um information i'd love to see new research that kind of goes over because virus names also change over time and sometimes they get folded into other names because they're actually the same organism or one is the isolate of another organism um so yeah so like new like within the last 10 or five years information about cannabis virome information is is really really necessary for cultivators and the main issue is that uh, most like most plant viruses, they can't really be conventionally controlled. You can't just like spray something or release something to destroy the virus. It's a systemically infecting pathogen that's usually lethal to the organism. Um, most people have already heard of the viroid, hop latent viroid. Now, a viroid is like a it's an even smaller virus that lacks what's called a protein capsule. Uh, which usually protects the interior of the virus or really everything that is the virus before it makes um, contact with the host or a vector. So viroids lack that protein capsule, which makes them super susceptible to the environment. But, um, and oftentimes viroids and other what are called subviral particles really rely on other viroids or other what are called satellites to kind of help their virulence or they really rely on a vector that they can either infect or sort of reside in uh, for safety so that they can travel the environment and get into the hosts that they infect. Um, beet curly top Iran virus um, is a relative of the beet curly top virus and the beet curly top virus is a recent, recently documented anyways, cannabis pest in uh, Colorado, for, for one example, but because bee curly top virus is found in so many places, I'm sure that if it hasn't already happened, there will be a lot more um, um, infections going on in various cannabis, cannabis cultivation areas. Um, Pukashi Earthworks, Brandon, this means clean your tools. That's very true. Clean your tools, clean your equipment. Um, you know, wash your hands, right? Biosecurity is no joke. And B. curly top virus in specific is only vectored by a leaf hopper, the B. leaf hopper called Circulifer tenalis. That's significant because unlike other viruses that might have various uh, vectors, this one only has one. So if you learn what it looks like and you learn where it is and if it's in your area, then you can make an educated um, decision as a cultivator, whether residential or commercial, about what you want to do to deal with that problem. Uh, and the reason I brought up beet, uh, beet curly top Huron virus is because um, it has been shown to have increased virulence in tomatoes colonized by uh, Funeliformis masi uh, due to the amount of viral resistance genes. Uh, our muscular mycorrhizal symbiosis enhances, uh, oh, it's icy. Our muscular mycorrhizal symbiosis actually enhances the, uh, viral, the viral accumulation in tomatoes with this mycorrhizal fungus. Like we were talking about earlier about um, mycorrhiza induced virus susceptibility. Relevant to cannabis, I think, it's possible that some of the mycorrhizae that we use can have negative effects when it comes to these uh, really horrific pathogens. That being said, I kind of feel like beet curly top virus and other viruses that I'll go over in a bit are probably also, they probably don't need any help. And so it might not be a really valid reason to not use mycorrhizae since if you almost assuredly will get an infection if you're exposed to the tissue or exposed to the virus with or without the mycorrhiza, at least you're getting the benefits of the mycorrhizal 
um, interaction, um, assuming that there are actual like benefits, assuming that you can actually quantify that, and assuming that the marketer who gave you mycorrhizae in a bottle or whatever um, is actually truthful or knows what they're talking about. Don't li don't lay over, for, don't like roll over for no data is the point I'm trying to make. And also be educated about what things can affect your plants. Um, so what are some other viruses that infect cannabis? Well, lettuce chlorosis virus. I have a pest primer about lettuce chlorosis virus on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol. And I go over the, it's a creamy virus. And it's a virus that is, the entire group creamy viruses are, uh, associated with the southwestern United uh, North America, um, and they are vectored by the silverleaf whitefly, Bamesia tabasi, which is a super vector of over 180 plant viruses, which is massive. Um, and uh, it's possible that it might even be able to, um, I think, host the B. curlitop virus in, in certain laboratory studies. I think they investigated the possibility of that. Um, but, uh, so silverleaf whitefly is a pest of cannabis as well. And the way that you control, uh, LCV is that you control the vector itself first. And that's the thing you need to keep from actually getting into your crop because once they do and they feed on the plant, then they've transmitted the virus and then they can just hop from plant to plant, or they can hop to that plant from an alternative host that has no symptoms for the LCV and, you just don't know that it's a haven for this virus that's just hanging out, waiting for a silver leaf white fly to come in, feed on the plant, get the virus in its body, and then move to a cannabis plant and then transmit it that way. Um, lightest chlorosis virus was found in cannabis first in Israel in the authorized farms. And that's, a, that's an important uh, point to make because it's associated with southwestern North America, but it was found in Israel, which is very far away from there. Um, so if that happened, then it's likely that it could go into various other places between there and here. And I just want people to be very aware of it, which is why I made that pest primer video on my channel. Um, I wanted to also say about that, that... Um, Lettuce chlorosis virus, like the name implies, also infects things like lettuce and also very, very various other kinds of uh, plants. So it is very possible for you to have viruses just hanging out with no symptoms in some plants and in, and in like really deleterious problematic symptoms in other plants like cannabis. And also, uh, silverleaf whitefly often causes chlorosis when it feeds on some plants anyways. So you don't even know if you have it necessarily just because you see the symptom of chlorosis, which is when the leaves go from green to like a yellowish color. Um, so that is, that is the chlorotic effect of the, of the virus. Um, yeah, so other viruses that you might encounter, B. top virus is one. Um, there's also a cannabis cryptic virus, which I have a pest primer about, which is really fascinating as a virus because it might be kind of a, it might represent a missing link between plant viruses and fungal viruses, which is kind of cool. Cannabis is all, is, is interesting. Cannabis is full of all these like neat and interesting like caveats when it comes to microbiology. Um, oh, and uh, I can keep talking or if we, or we could respond to some questions. Well, there are some questions, but my, my question is, is it seems like with cannabis and virus and viroids, I mean, there are two things. One, like with human populations, when it was sparse and spread out, you know, in terms of transmission of diseases versus like, like corn farming in the Midwest, there is such a concentration versus like during the Aztec, you know, days when, you know, obviously they were cultivating corn, but you know, little pockets of, of production. Uh, so my assumption is that a, as populations of cannabis plants and hemp take on hundreds and thousands of acres, like seas of plants that we'll see an explosion of kind of new novel viruses and viroids. And then kind of the concept of pathogens or viruses that go between types of plants versus that are unique to one plant like uh you know coronavirus I, I think they said in the san diego zoo all all the apes now have it or something like that 
So it was transmitted mm -hmm. from human to ape. Um, you know, it's, yeah. Are are there, there not are there examples of of kind of viruses that have gone for like like fusarium and bananas wouldn't be a risk to cannabis, what right? Be? Because it's a fusarium. fusarium? Fusarium infects cannabis. In fact, I just found it recently. But 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 a different like if you had a banana plant with a fusarium that kills it, uh -huh. it would not. It'd be a distinct fusarium from the one that works on cannabis. Correct? Not necessarily. Like it's not the same. Okay, so so it's the same genetic fusarium. Like if you did well, like a DNA sequencing or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So like you get to this, there's this really valid question about the species concept that I won't get into too much because I'm way too loquacious for that. But basically you're on the right track that like over time, so some things like Fusarium, which is a fungus, but also various viruses um, might be super generalistic essentially. Um, but then you, but then because, especially because viruses um, replicate so gosh darn much, um, they can't help but make a bunch of mutations. They're the most, they're the most, uh, how would I phrase this? They replicate the most of all replicons, as they call them. Um, things that reproduce like kind of like you and I, although not quite like us, right? In, in terms of viruses, they could specialize. You could have an adaptation to a specific species or genera or genus, I should say, or family of plants. Um, but like Fusarium specifically is a really interesting example because there's tons of Fusarium species that are documented. But are they, but it's a question of like, are they how different are they? If they're 99 percent the same and they only have a couple of genes that allow them to, um, you know, infect a specific group of plants, then it can be useful for us to actually categorize them as a very different thing distinctly because they're a di they're a distinct biosecurity threat. Meanwhile. You might have 20 or 50 different fusarium uh, species that could infect, let's say, cannabis or some other plant. And they might essentially have practically identical systemic infection rates and practically identical effects on the plant, which is to say it kills it. Um, but yeah, I think that you, you essentially are on the right track with the idea that like things can get specialized and um, things can get a lot worse for those uh, populations for which the pathogen specializes. And as populations grow, like you say, as cannabis cultivation becomes even larger, as more people grow both residentially and commercially, this will become an issue. San Diego, since you mentioned it, has recently been found with Huanglong Bing, the citrus greening disease, which is a, a phytoplasma. It's a very small bacteria that lacks a cell wall and it's um, one of a group of phytoplasmas. There are hemp phytoplasmas too, which I'll get into, but they're basically incurable. There aren't very many options for the control of them, at least that are commercially viable anyways. Um, and in Florida, for example, it's, it's really severely stunted the, the citriculture. Something like 70% of citriculture in Florida for like the last 12 years, I wanna say, or maybe a little bit more or less, uh, is gone because the citrus green disease is vectored by the citrus uh, psyllid and then that citrus psyllid feeds on the plants and then the bacteria gets in the phloem and then it colonizes systemically and it causes the plants the ripe fruit becomes unripe the leaves fall off they turn a different color the branches literally gnarl and curl into each other it's gone it's like you can't grow anything out of that. And so they had to literally pull out entire orchards that have been around for decades because of this pathogen. It's finally in California. Well, it's been in California for very, for a long time, actually, but people have been able to make um, uh, quarantine zones and, and, and make uh, treatment applications and that kind of a thing. But I kind of knew it would eventually come here. And if we're not smart about it, we might lose a ton of old, uh, citrus cultivars, especially ones that are residential and might not even exist commercially anymore. It's kind of, it's kind of sad. Um, and I hope the same thing doesn't happen with cannabis, but I actually expect that it will become a problem because biosecurity measures are for a lot of obvious reasons, just not in effect, um, because of the way that people trade tissue around and even at commercial levels. 
Um, there was a. Uh, oh, so so I I talked to Chadwick Rhodes uh, yesterday. Uh, this is something that you've been thinking about, right? Or banker? Oh yeah. Uh, and then I think there's uh yeah Sean has part two. So Are you in favor of no cover crop mulch or no? So no cover crop, but mulch, mono crop, mixed blend cover crop, and then also companion planting was the other part of the question, right? What are your thoughts on companion planting with cannabis? Oh, what a smooth system you have up here! You can just go right from one to the other. That's very nice, very nice, Peter. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I I think that the boring answer I'll give. It's context dependent. Uh, um, I like banker plants for predatory mites and other pollen feeding biocontrol agents. But it is important to consider that uh, the more plant matter you put out there, the more you might have uh, pests come in. A lot of the pests of cannabis are generalists. They actually feed on tons of other plants too. And pepper plants have their fair share of um, overlapping pest populations that you have to worry about. So if you do companion plant, I think it's really invaluable that you do not consider them as separate entities in most cases and treat them kind of the same. If you crop scout the plants, uh, the cannabis crop, uh, the primary crop, also scout your cover crop, also scout your companion plants. Like don't don't just assume that they can't get anything because they definitely can and they, they will. They will. Um, Russell Pace of the Cannabis Horticultural Association and I have worked together on a Baker plant pro, uh, uh, program using ornamental baker pepper plants for predatory mites like Amblycia swirsky and Neocilius cucumeris, and they eat the pollen and the females make many more eggs that way, and the populations can um, sustain themselves when there are very low levels or no levels of uh, various prey, which is a really great boon because then you don't have to buy them so 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 much, right? I'm looking at that. There was a question about, uh, and I know, um, hold on a second. It, it was basically about the Israelis who were breeding out. Yeah. Uh, what's your take on the Israeli cannabis cultivar that was edited to be powdery mildew resistant? Yeah. So this was really interesting. I think I forget their name off the top of my head. It's like can, it's like can gene or something like that. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, so this happened recently. Um, they, they made a bit of a splash on social media and other places. I mean, I, I actually posed this question recently on the Discord, on the Future Cannabis Project Discord, which is the question of what is the functional difference between um, a cannabis plant Oh, well, I'll have to explain this a little bit after the, the, the point, but if a cannabis plant has something called a susceptibility gene, which a lot of plants do, that allows powdery mildew and other fungi to infect because the gene or what the gene affects of the plant is necessary for the pathogen to actually colonize. So it makes use of its own, of the plant's own genes um, and effects can breed, can breed. Thank you so much, James Chrysler. Chrysler? Anyways. Um, the susceptibility gene is called that because it's a, it's a weakness. It actually, and, but you see, here's the thing. Um, uh, it's not just a weakness because this, uh, the mic, um, sorry, I'm, I'm stumbling over my words, but there's a group of, of powdery mildew associated genes called mildew locus O it's conserved in a ton of different plants. And for a long time, uh, it was thought that well, why would a plant conserve and keep these genes if they cause the plant to be susceptible to many pathogens? It just doesn't make sense. The selection pressure should have gotten rid of it. Well, guess what? They're also really important for establishing mycorrhizal connections with other fungi because the pathogenic fungi and the beneficial fungi, the mutualistic fungi, use the same genetic machinery a lot of the time or essentially the same genetic machinery or processes or pathways at the very least to interact with the host, whether it's going to be in a parasitic way or a mutualistic way. 
So that's the reason why it's conserved in so many plants because it has a boon for a lot. It's a benefit for many plants. But why do I bring, I bring this up? Because uh, you could, uh, through mutation, um, the plant could just lose some of these uh, susceptibility genes and function more or less the same, except for those interactions with mycorrhizae, but it also inhibit the powdery mildew development. So, but what is the functional difference between knocking out one or two of these genes or having them be lost in the population kind of naturally, we could say, just through mutation or or suppression by some other pathogen or, or um, mutualist or something like that. But uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm kind of skeptical. I don't really know very much about uh, the process itself here. I definitely would say that I'm excited about the potential for, for beneficial effects, but I don't know. I just feel like, I feel like there are like with jet, the mildew locust. Jet, thing, jet, you, jet, I just jet. like, can you hear me? Just quickly keep going with this and then go with that. I got to grab a, a Gemma oh, sure. upstairs. So you see that yeah, no cities problem. thing? Yeah, great highlight. I really appreciate that. Um, so yeah, this connects well. So CD Soulshine Growing says this connects well to our alpha fold two protein folding software conversation. Matthew, care to riff on that? I would if I remembered it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm blanking on the exact details of that conversation, but it sounds like something we were talking about. I kind of remember. Um, yeah, but I agree. So like, so I'm excited about the possibility for using our understanding of genes in general for cannabis and other plants and the important relationship between uh, genes, microbes, and the interface between plants and various microbes that way. So it's a really important factor. And if we don't understand the genetic component, which is kind of the ecological unit, the fundamental ecological unit is like the gene for a lot of things. Um, it's just really, it's just really important. But for the same reason why knocking out mildew locus O could cause problems with developing symbioses with various fungi, both beneficial and detrimental, I'm skeptical about making these sort of alterations to the genetic code in the same way that we've unintentionally done so through human uh, cultivation of plants a long, 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 long time ago, millennia ago, uh, people were cultivating plants at, to various degrees and moving plants away from their original areas into new areas and by doing so, making selection pressures, um, what we call domestication. So I do think that and they didn't know they didn't know what a gene was. They didn't understand those fundamental concepts like we do now. And some could say that they caused some irrevocable uh, damage or at the very least changes to the cannabis populations that we have today. And that's true for a lot of other agricultural crops for that matter. Um, so yeah, like Vital Alchemist says, marker assisted breeding, oh, is the future. I definitely agree with the, yeah, like you have to know what the genes are. So whether you know about them one way or the other, that's one thing. How you process it and what you do with that information is an entirely different subject, but I definitely think it's important to know about it for all the reasons I already listed about microbiome, uh, plant interaction. Um, but yeah, CD Soulshine growing, I, I'm sorry to say that I don't remember the exact details of that um, topic, but if you want to um, expand in the comments section and jog my memory, I can totally riff off of that and be happy to do so. It sounds like it was a cool concept, but I just don't know what's going on. <laughs> um, in, the, uh, in the interim though, I did want to talk a little bit about something called Ropel siphon patyvirus, which is a creepa virus. Um, part of the family Desistroviridae, and what's unique about it is that it can systemically interact with, or it can systemically colonize many plants and also various aphid species. Now, the rice root aphid is Ropalsiphum rufi abdominale, Wait, and it's a close relative of Ropalsiphum okay. patty. And um, it's like, and it also is infected. Uh, the rice root aphid is infected by this virus, and it can, and this virus can exist in plants for about two weeks. So that's relevant because we could possibly make use of it and have it infect the 
the pests that we don't like, or we can try to colonize other plants with it as well and kind of create like a, a living barrier of resistance potentially. Because what the virus does is it infects the ribosomes of the rice root aphid and causes a, a huge severe decrease in fecundity, ability to make um, progeny, and also in longevity, two really major traits that make aphids so much of a pain in the first place. So if we could control that or mitigate it somehow with a naturally occurring viral parasite, I think that'd be a really great idea. Speaking of, of like, you know, sort of novel concepts in that, in that light. Um, oh, so the alpha two AI. Oh yeah. Okay. The AI, that's the part I didn't remember. That's the key word there. So yeah. So the alpha, the alpha fold two AI can do protein folding modeling accurately. And you mentioned a novel way to address the common vector for mycorrhizae and powdery mildew could be developed with alpha fold two. Yeah. So, right. So for those who don't know, that was a really, that made a really huge splash in the, like the genomics, um, uh, community that essentially our theories and ideas about genes and proteins and how they're produced and what's possible even have become so sophisticated that we now can create artificial intelligence that if we give them a set of rules can kind of go through a bunch of different uh, hypothetical speculative possibilities uh, which would be critical for kind of predicting uh, with great accuracy and precision what potential either artificial uh but but i think much more relevant to this conversation natural pathways for microbial interaction whether they're pathogens or mutualists and um i think that using technology like that would be really really beneficial for for again for a lot of different reasons like we already kind of went over and again, it kind of goes back to that point where it's important for us to, as we move forward, kind of be aware of how important genes are, how important microbial relationships are, how do they develop, how do they not develop, and what can we do to facilitate the developments we want and uh, mitigate the developments that we don't want. So I really appreciate um, you bringing that up because I think that's, a, that's kind of, um, it's very relevant to this topic of conversation. Um, yeah, so that was, that was a really good, that was a really good question. Oh, hey there. <laughs> I love it. Nice picture. <laughs> Final Alchemist says, Ooh, please touch on Pantoia and locust swarming. Uh, wish, which wish that I could. Um, but I just don't, uh, it's, it's escaped my mind. You could put it in the comments, though. Maybe I've forgotten about this interaction myself, or maybe I never even knew about it in the, per in the first place. Um, I feel like you might have talked about it, but I just don't remember. Um, what do I have here? Oh, but, you know, I'll, I will go through my notes, and we can talk about that if you want to. Um, oh, yeah, you're welcome for riffing on that uh, CD Soulshine growing. Um, where was it here? Yeah. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier there's there's um, there are uh, a couple of microbial pop, uh, species that we use in cultivation to get rid of pests. So um, Bouveria bassiana is one of my favorites. It's an entomopathogenic fungus. That means that it's a fungus that colonizes and kills uh, entomos or insects and other arthropods for that matter. The ancestral, and so Bavaria bassiana is a cordyceps family fungus. So it has an interaction, and it has a broad host range of many different insect species. And it's associated with the soil. But the neat thing about it, and other relatives of this group, is that ancestrally they evolved to uh, colonize arthropods, insects, mites, that kind of a thing. And then over time, they gained an additional lifestyle. They were able to not just exist in the soil and colonize these insects, but they were also able to colonize as endophytes inside the tissue of plants. So it benefits the plants because they repel and kill uh, herbivorous insects and mites. Um, they, so the, that's the benefit for the plant. One of the benefits for the fungus is not only does it get a neat shelter to exist in, 
but it also uh, is a way for them to have a vector through the plant to colonize these insects that are important for at least one aspect of their reproductive cycle in, in nature anyways. And so they can colonize the insect, kill it, um, and then sporulate the cadaver and then spread the spores that way. Um, I bring it up though, because as it would turn out, um, there is a virus called Buveria bastiana, small narna-like virus, and these virus names can get a little bit, a little bit wordy. Um, and this virus actually induces a mild hypervirulence, uh, which means that it increases the virulence of Buveria bastiana against pests, or against herbivorous insects, I should say, many of which are pests. This is relevant, of course, because we could potentially inoculate Puveria bastiana isolates that are already by themselves really virulent against pests, and then have the virus included in there, and then further augment and increase the virulence of Puveria bastiana. So that's actually a really cool concept to me, and I think that we should explore that. As far as I know, it's not really done for whatever reason, um, but I'm really excited about that kind of research. I also gave a kind of... Um, sort of a, another example that deals with another fungus, but it's a pathogen. Most people have heard of Botrytis cinerea, which is the gray bud rot mold uh, fungus, you know, um, noble rot in grapes, as many people know it to be. But um, Botrytis has um, hypovirulence viruses, so hypovirulence, so uh, impaired virulence. So as a pathogen of so many different kinds of plants, which I also have a pest primer about, about Botrytis, we could perhaps use viruses to inoculate botrytis and cause them to have huge, severe problems in colonizing the plants we want to protect from botrytis, which is many of them. Um, some examples of viruses that we know of already that do have a hypovirulence effect on its on their hosts, which is botrytis, is botrytis scenario hypovirus, which is a oh, hypovirus one, uh, botrytis orma-like virus and Botrytis scenario negative stranded RNA virus one. Again, kind of a wordy name, but it really tells you what it does, I suppose. Um, so these viruses, uh, when they colonize Botrytis, they cause Botrytis to not be very good at colonizing plants. And that's of course what we would want, right? So I just wanted to bring that out there since we we're talking about the microbiome of cannabis, that this could, these could be viruses associated with fungi, associated with cannabis. And you've got this like, you know, hierarchical structure where it just goes, you know, turtles all the way down, so to speak. And I think that's actually maybe all of my notes, all of my like talking points that I wanted to get through. Yeah, that's actually all of them. So we can probably do questions and things at this point. Okay, well, Bingo has been very patient with his caterpillar question, so he must be in oh. SoCal. <laughs> <laughs> right or everywhere else on the west coast how to keep caterpillars from attacking my cannabis plants i get them every year it's a great question um have you tried not growing plants ever <laughs> so so right so so there's a couple of options that are available to you um sort of the cop-out answer is that like if you're able to control your environment if you're able to like erect physical barriers whether that's an indoor growing uh, situation or an outdoor growing situation with a greenhouse or with mesh screen that's like my number one advice for a couple of reasons one you only pay for it once unless you you know break the screen or whatever you're using to keep them out um it's also a really great way to get rid of a ton of other insects that are way smaller than moths and um, the caterpillars that they produce from their eggs. Because see, the moths fly around and they're kind of large and especially the ones that go into uh, cannabis, like your corn earworm, your cotton bollworm, your uh, arm, various army worms, which I have a video about on my YouTube channel um, because various uh, out, what are called outlet moths, the uh, heliothene moths. Um, they're very hard or almost imp or really impossible to tell the difference about in larvae, but they're a huge problem in many different crops, including cannabis, and they bore into the flower. And many people already know this, especially in the chat. But um, 
the moths fly around and they're quite large, they have to lay the eggs on the plant material itself. And if you have a screen, you can keep them necessarily from getting into your crop in the first place. And that that eliminates your problem immediately. You don't have to do anything about that when you do it. And it's, it's usually worth the, the cost savings for labor and um, application of a product, whether, again, you're a commercial facility or you're just growing a couple of plants by yourself. Um, that's my number one uh, advice because I feel like most people can apply it in some way, shape, or form. Sometimes you have to get creative, but um, that's a really good option in my opinion. You can also apply things like um, there are some uh, polyhedrosis viruses that are used for this, the species that infect or that colonize cannabis. Uh, this is a spray-on virus that kills the caterpillar. Uh, but it, you have to apply it a bunch of times, and it only really works if the... Oh, could you put the comment back up? I just kind of talked right over it. Um, all netting grow this year outdoor. No more fighting insects and butterflies. Yeah, totally agree with that. Totally agree with that. Con yeah, it's it's really useful, really beneficial, and you only have to put it up once. It might be a little bit of work, a little bit of hassle, but you only have to put it up once if you do it right. And that well, kind of and Tyler from Family Tree Seeds said you can kind of time it just right before they start flowering, because those mm. the, those moths that they're the flower is what they want, so they're not really showing up in any numbers until you're kind of at that stage. Yeah, and you should also know the season. So, like, and depending on where you are, this will be very <laughs> different, right? Like. Um, a train a team of tiny bird ninjas. Yeah, like get your parakeets out there, uh, make them work for you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can you can definitely uh, time it so that like the springtime, summertime when they're coming out of the pupa as adults, you want to make sure you have that netting in possibly even before the flowering occurs, so you can save yourself some time. But you're right, if you time it for the flowers, like that could be also a beneficial way to go about it if you're on a time crunch or you can't get them right now or something like that. Uh, but yeah, knowing the what are called what's called the bionomics, knowing the, like the life cycle and the physiology and all of these different interactions is really critical for your integrated pest management. And I often have to use that to get the really great nuanced um, uh, techniques out there for people to utilize. Oh, James Chrysler brings up, um, my only concern with using viruses and fungi for pest control is a mishap of spreading to wild populations. I know it's a bit of a stretch, but still it's not a bit, a bit of a stretch at all. I would say that that's a really important thing. And one thing that I often advocate, uh, even though I love Bouveria bassiana and various other um, entomopathogenic bacteria and fungi and viruses, is that, yeah, you could very well, if you're not responsible, have a sort of a colonization event. And you can kind of ruin the local ecology if you're not careful with your chemical runoff as well as your biological controls that you're using. Uh, just because they're natural and biological doesn't mean that they can't have problems or they can't upset the native population. Just ask, you know, any cat owner. They kill tons of native organisms all over the earth. And I know this will give me a little bit of hate, but they have caused some major issues in, in places where the habitats are very fragile. And Bouveri Bastiana has a huge broad spectrum range. So that's true for Bouveri Bastiana as well. But it's also kind of around the earth uh, it's very cosmopolitan in that way as well. So I feel a little bit better about using it, but that's a totally valid point to make. And I think a conscientious cultivator should consider that as well. So Gemma, do you remember when we had caterpillars this year? Mm -hmm. What did we do? So we looked on the ground, we found a caterpillar, we put it on, we put it on the we put it on the table at Tom's, and then, um, and then, and then I got some leaves, and then it was gone. <laughs> yeah, you, you, she, she, she tried to feed it leaves. <laughs> <laughs> and then we put it in a little vial of alcohol, and, uh, and that was the end of that. That was the end of that. Let me know when it's not, though. I have a fiction book to write. <laughs> 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 or maybe a nonfiction book at that point.
Yeah, I hope that I hope that continues to be a great way to get rid of them. <laughs> so, so R. Kinner is very adamant that beneficial plants and essential oils work best for IPM. Work best or just work? Oh, I work see. best. I see. Work, work best. Work best for IPM, right? Um, I mean, what is best after all, right? I think it's context dependent. I think there's tons of essential oil products and. Uh, beneficial plants that can be useful, but let's not forget how evolution actually works. If you use too much of one thing, whether it's a biocontrol, chemical, whatever, there are there are aspects of resistance that aren't just genetic. There's so-called behavioral resistances, which I guess are partly genetic, since we our genes do interact with our mind and our behavior and that kind of a thing. But they're definitely they're definitely like I guess you could call them like soft resistances, like uh, a population might uh, over time already have the mutation that makes it resistant to a chemical. And only by using the chemical do you select for that to be even greater proportionally in the population because all the ones that don't die and all the ones that do survive. Similarly, sometimes behavioral adaptations establish and that could totally happen with a companion plant that you're using or with an essential oil or something. Um, various compounds and volatiles produced by plants. Um, we learn about them having repellent effects or attractive eff attractant effects for like predators of the pests and that kind of a thing. But uh, various organisms can become conditioned or confused because they either adapted to select against uh, reading those compounds. Every population is a little bit different and given enough time, native populations and introduced populations um, and various cultures like from commercial entities might not have the, the um, uh, interaction that you would expect them to have um, in that way. Oh, do we have another picture? That's me. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> On the yellow sticky. Uh... Uh, someone at uh, spiders in IPM, I would think absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'd like to see more of it, honestly. But uh, one big thing that prevents us from using spiders as like a as a more like normal integrated pest management biocontrol, like we do for like predatory mites. They don't play nice with each other. They're typically cannibalistic. And so, and this is also true for silk for that matter. Silk production of spider by spiders uh, like in mass is very hard to do traditionally because of this reason. There are some spiders that are gregarious and they make giant nets and that kind of a thing, but um, uh, it just doesn't work out so well. Uh, I would say that if you have a spider and it's not a medically significant species, which will depend on where you're from and a bunch of other things, um, you know, just leave it alone if it's not causing a problem for cultivation anyways. Um, I love jumping spiders for that matter. They're uh, really great predators and they really punch above their weight class and they're really cute and interesting. And they're also nimble enough and don't make um, a bunch of big old webs for you to like run into. So honestly, I think they're a, they're a great gain if you have any in your crop. And people, this is the second comment about anti-pollen netting. You, you'd need a super fine micron, like. Yeah, maybe thing. like an electro, maybe if it's electrostatic or something, like if yeah. it's like a, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm not very familiar with the anti-pollen netting. I'd love to learn more about that, Magma Seeds. If you got a, a link for us in the comments or if you got like a, oh, anything, honestly, just tell me more. Mm. Yeah, Del right. Man asks, has anybody ever looked into carnivorous plants? I sure have. Um, they're, first of all, they're really fascinating to me, but so is most of these topics. Um, sundews, Venus flytraps, pitcher plants, um, things like that. I don't feel like they're, they don't typically, I, the reason why I don't think they'd be a really great addition is because they're probably not cost effective and a lot of carnivorous plants developed carnivory because they exist in a really nutrient poor environment in the uh, substrate anyways that's why you see them in marshes and fens and swamps and that kind of a thing because there's not there, there's not a lot of nitrogen and other sorts of things so the way that they got their nitrogen other nutrients is through 
eating other organisms or in some way facilitating the organic matter to get into them. Uh, some some pitcher plants have become uh, urinals and uh, toilets for various uh, rodents because, uh, well, because that's how they get their nutrients. I won't go into it. You can yeah, you can yeah. look Every, that you can Google everybody, that. Yourself. Everybody's into the jumping <laughs> spiders. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah. Um, Gemma's complaining that she can smell my armpits right now. Oh man. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> well, I don't for whatever that's worth. Yes. Fortunately, the rest of you cannot. Well, let's uh, maybe wrap it there for today so I can uh, get Gemma ready for her exciting... Gemma, what class do you have? I have Professor Egghead. So Professor Egghead. And Professor what you... Egghead, so I can be a secret agent. Oh, yeah, so you can be a secret agent. Mm -hmm. And what are you making? You're making like a... a... Yeah. <laughs> she, she <laughs> guys like to do a little Gemma show and a little, tell. A little show and tell, yeah. All right, this is this is our surprise. Wait, you brought pear? Pear. Okay, I, um, all right, leave the pear. All right, so you got your battery and your light. So there's the light, right? There's the light. And then you have a bat. Oh, Jesus. All right, yeah, put that there. And then... So in Gemma's egghead class today, she's going to take this battery and these wires and that light out. and uh, a little bit scared about the be wires. a little, little budding Tesla. Te are you Tesla or Edison? Oh, uh, you mean like, um, well, like a, like a, oh man, I'm blanking on the term, not a Faraday cage, but a. I, I know what you're talking about. I think I know what you're trying to refer to. I think, but it, just running a current into the bat. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Into the That's wire. A, yeah, like yeah, electromagnetism. One, one on top, one on the bottom. Oh yeah, very cool. Very cool to to get exposed to that at an early age. Definitely. Yeah, that's a good secret agent skill. That's you true. You, you never know when you have to make a makeshift Goss weapon. <laughs> just uh, <laughs> just you know, out of spare Thank parts. You, sure. And by the way, anyone who wants to support FCP, you can go over to uh, over there and pick up one of these shirts. For the price of an expensive Starbucks per month, you can be the proud owner of this shirt and uh, support the FCP and Mossy Giant. <laughs> Je Je Gemma is usually my t-shirt model, and then she takes pictures of me, and those are the pictures that go up on the website so Jim, we got to take some more pictures this weekend are you ready to be a, a i don't think so i don't think you're happy with me being the model be there go like this yeah she she she, she, uh, she, she, she works she the works the camera the she works the camera and i'm like Gemma, just smile and stand there <laughs> so anyway have you have, have you yeah, thought nikolai nikolai tesla yeah not not the car cut. Gemma, stop smelling my armpits. You're so weird. <laughs> have you have you considered that maybe uh, working the camera might make your secret agent profession difficult? Yeah, she has, she has to be Gemma. To be a secret agent, you have to be subtle and discreet, and uh, not smell people's armpits. That's right. Not smell people's armpits. That's true. It does yeah. call attention to yourself. Smelling armpits is only appropriate at home and with me and only while a couple hundred people are watching. That's right. <laughs> so. All right. Well, we'll be back. What are we talking about next Wednesday? Right. So this one was about the microbiome of cannabis and some research related to that and some cool facts. But the next one will be about, um, I want to set up an integrated pest management FAQ, essentially. Cause, so a lot of the questions we had here, but just have a whole a whole uh, video of them because I talk too much and I'd like to answer more questions. <laughs> so bring your IPM. So the caterpillar question would be a good one for next week. Definitely. We already kind of answered that this week, but uh, and then tomorrow 
morning we have weed should taste good um who's been on in the past um well that's the name i thought that was the topic <laughs> yeah well it, it is yeah it, it's partially right. the topic too how do you drive terpenes to Gemma? who's this mr burger yeah Je Gemma calls him a burger he's like a cheeseburger or a hamburger I'm a nose booger. Oh, he's a booger. He's a nose booger. Mm -hmm. oh. oh. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, Mr. Booger. <laughs> booger. Got booger it. terps. Right. <laughs> Those boogie terps. All right, so I will see you next Wednesday. I look and, forward to uh, And I'll be back in, I believe, at 10 in the morning. And now I'm going to go do some mad science experiments with Gemma, so... And Excellent. Gemma promises that she's going to start drawing again so we can have some new artwork. And she may autograph some. Will you autograph some art and we'll ship it out to people? There you go. Fans? Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> All right. See you, everyone. Thanks, All right. Matthew. See you, everyone. You're very welcome. <laughs> See you next week. All right. Bye.